Welcome to the Cure PSP webinar series. Cure PSP's mission is to provide education and support for people and their families affected by PSP, CBD, MSA, and related brain diseases while funding research towards a cure and prevention. Webinars are made possible by the generosity of donors and other supporters. My name is Bruce Ginelli and I am the Director of Communications and Marketing at Cure PSP. The topic of our webinar today is a guide to PSP for staff in long-term care and community settings. Questions for our speaker will be accepted at the end of the presentation. At that time, a chat box will appear at the bottom of your screen where you will be able to type and submit any questions you may have. We will field as many questions as time allows. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Teresa Moore. Teresa has worked as a clinical nurse at the Center's at the Center for Movement Disorders in Markham, Ontario for five years. The center serves patients and families affected by Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, multiple system atrophy, corticobasal degeneration, and Huntington's disease. Teresa is involved in patient care, education, and research, and is leading a study to improve support for people affected by PSP. Her background includes teaching baccalaureate and nursing students, teaching patient-centered care and therapeutic touch workshops to staff in hospitals and hospices, and providing leadership in geriatric nursing as a clinical nurse specialist and professional practice leader. Teresa lost her mother to PSP, and she draws on both her professional knowledge and personal experience in her work. She is dedicating this presentation today to the memory of her late mother. Teresa? Thank you, Bruce, and I'd also like to thank the other staff and volunteers at Cure PSP for the valuable work that you do on behalf of people with PSP and related disorders and for serving as the host of this webinar. And I'd like to welcome all of the participants to this webinar and thank you for your interest and your time and for the support that you are providing to your clients with PSP. The objectives for this presentation are to understand what PSP is, to learn about symptoms and care options, to put this information within the context of the whole person and their family, and to evaluate the benefit of this presentation. This webinar is part of a research project funded by Parkinson Society Canada and conducted with assistance from Cure PSP. The study aims to improve support to people with PSP and their families. And in this phase of the research, various educational materials, including this presentation, are being tested to ensure that they are as helpful as possible. Therefore, you'll be asked to respond to three short questions at the end of the presentation. And I'd like to thank you in advance for taking a few minutes to do so. So what is progressive super? nuclear palsy, or PSP. It is a rare brain disease, but it shares some features with a disease that many people are more familiar with, which is Parkinson's disease. Like Parkinson's, people with PSP have slow movement, muscle stiffness, and poor balance. However, unlike Parkinson's, the stiffness affects the neck more than the limbs, and the balance problems occur earlier, and in fact, balance is often the first symptom. Also, unlike Parkinson's, tremor is rare. Eye movements are impaired, especially movements up and down. Speech and swallowing problems occur earlier and with greater severity. Changes occur in personality and thinking. There is rapid deterioration. There is a poor response to medication. Usually, these medications are either levodopa or amantadine. And only about 30% of people respond to medications. And this response is usually incomplete and short-lived because multiple brain chemicals are deficient. And PSP is much less common, affecting only five or six people out of every hundred thousand. And this means that many people are unfamiliar with PSP, including healthcare professionals, 
which can make it difficult to diagnose, provide care, and find resources. In an earlier phase of our study, we learned that many patients and families find this lack of knowledge among healthcare providers very challenging, and they find it very burdensome to have to educate every healthcare provider that they come in contact with. And so today's presentation is one of the educational strategies that we're testing to try and address this challenge. In people with PSP, there's gradual deterioration of brain cells in several areas of the brain, especially those involved in movement, including the pons, midbrain, cerebellum, and the basal ganglia. Abnormal clumps of t or tangles of tau protein develop, and while normal tau protein maintains the cell structure, clumping of tau protein destroys the cell. The result of this brain damage is that signals from the brain to various parts of the body are distorted or blocked. The name progressive supranuclear palsy reflects the nature of the disease. Progressive, of course, meaning that the symptoms get worse over time. Supranuclear, telling us that there's damage to brain cells above, or supra, to a group of cells called the nuclei. And palsy, indicating that there's weakness of eye and body movement. Other names for PSP are Steele Richardson Oshaleski syndrome, after the three scientists who first recognized it in 1963 in Toronto, atypical Parkinsonism, and Parkinson's Plus. Research is ongoing, with much of this research being funded and coordinated by our host organization today, Cure PSP. However, there isn't yet any way to predict, prevent, slow, or cure PSP. So the goal of care is really to offer options to manage symptoms in order to preserve or enhance quality of life. And as nursing theorist Rosemary Parsi put it, quality of life is not what those outside think it is, but rather what the person living the life says it is. So today I'll be presenting a number of care options related to the symptoms of PSP with the understanding that each person affected by the disease will have a unique constellation of symptoms and will make different choices based on their values and life experiences. And just as our experiences of events change over time, the person's choices about care options may also change over time. And this approach is consistent with patient-centered care, which means adopt perspective about what matters. And this is an important concept, whether you're a paid caregiver or a family member who's advocating on your loved one's behalf. And patient-centered care includes respecting the person's choices, even when they're different from what we think we would choose if we were in their situation. So let's begin to look at some of the symptoms and care options. Falls occur early and often in PSP and are the first symptom in approximately 60% of individuals. PSP symptoms that contribute to fall and mobility issues include impaired balance, stiffness of the neck, trunk, and legs, inability to move the eyes downwards to scan the environment for obstacles or changes in terrain, freezing where the feet get stuck to the ground while the upper body continues to move forward, and impulsivity. And this results from damage to that part of the brain that normally says, stop, that's not safe. So the person may walk too quickly, try to get up on their own, or reach too far. In addition to the usual mobility and fall prevention strategies, care options that are particularly helpful in PSP are the use of verbal cues for freezing. For example, the person or their caregiver might repeat left, right, left, right, or if the person's using a walker, push, stop, step or encouraging them to rock from side to side. Using a walker can help with balance and freezing. 
And the U-step walker, although large and costly, is specifically designed to project a laser light onto the floor so that the person can step over it to prevent or overcome freezing. Adding weight to the front of the walker can also be useful because the person usually will fall backwards. So soft weights put into the basket, or if there's no basket wrapped around the legs, um, can be helpful to provide a little bit of balance. Physiotherapists and occupational therapists can help with selection of equipment, home adaptations, and exercises to maintain strength and flexibility. And again, recognizing that impulsivity is part of the disease process, and it's not stubbornness or refusal to heed advice. Medications can sometimes help with muscle stiffness and slow movement, which can reduce falls. But as I mentioned previously, they're not always effective. And even when they are, they're not um, completely effective. Swallowing difficulties are another key feature of the disease and they occur early on. Signs of swallowing problems can include coughing or choking when eating or drinking, a gurgly, wet voice, food collecting in the mouth, and slow eating. And if food enters the lungs, pneumonia can develop. And this is the most common cause of death among those with PSP. PSP symptoms that contribute to difficulty swallowing include damage or loss of brain cells that control swallowing, weakness or lack of coordination of throat muscles, hyperextension of the neck, which means that food is more likely to enter the airway. And again, that part of the brain that says, hold on, this isn't safe, is damaged, so that the person will often eat or drink impulsively. They may overfill their mouth or drink very quickly. Care options include first recognizing, monitoring for the signs of difficulty, a swallowing assessment by a speech language pathologist to evaluate swallowing and make recommendations to improve safety. And the recommendations can include things such as positioning with the chin tucked down, verbal cues to remind the person to slow down or to swallow, special utensils such as a flexi cup so that the person doesn't have to put their head back as far when they're drinking, limiting distractions, limiting any foods that trigger coughing or choking, changing the texture or moisture of food, or adding thickeners. And if the person has excess saliva, measures to deal with that may also be helpful, and we'll be talking about those in a moment. Food is a great source of pleasure for us and for many people, and the choice about if and when to adopt the recommendations is a very personal one. Some people, in fact maybe many people, may choose to be at risk so that they can continue to enjoy their favorite foods. While the person is still able to speak clearly, it may also be helpful to determine if the person wants to talk about the pros and cons of tube feeding with their family and the healthcare team. This way, if swallowing or speech becomes severely impaired in the future, the person's wishes about tube feeding will be known. There's a really excellent resource for guiding this discussion, which I'll provide you at the end of the uh, presentation when we look at some uh, internet links. There's also an excellent and very comprehensive article on swallowing issues in the May-June 2012 issue of the PSP, Cure PSP newsletter. Um, I looked yesterday and that newsletter wasn't yet online, but I expect it will be going online very shortly at this website, and so you can look for that. It's uh, really the best article I've ever seen over the years in terms of um, providing guidance. Drooling can occur as well and is often due to decreased frequency of swallowing or weak or uncoordinated throat muscles. Care options include uh, terry cloth wristbands to absorb the saliva. These can be purchased in a sporting goods store um, and they really allow the person not to be having always to hold on to Kleenex or be searching for their Kleenexes. Reminders to swallow such as gum or candy, if we have these in our mouth and it's safe to have them, um, they, we will automatically swallow more often. 
There are also uh, pocket or button metronomes which may uh, be used to remind people to swallow. Atropine drops normally used in the eyes can be given under the tongue to dry up secretions and these are available by prescription. Sometimes medication like gamantadine can help. And Botox can be injected into the salivary glands under EMG guidance, which will be need, need to be repeated every three to six months. Speech difficulties among people with PSP include slurring, explosive, or irregular speech. And speech is eventually lost completely due to damage to the part of the brain that controls movements of the tongue, mouth, and throat. Care options include using yes or no questions, writing if the person is able, using hand signals such as thumbs up and thumbs down, or eye signals where the person looks to the right or left or blinks. Patience and understanding are also really important and trying to make the environment as conducive as possible by minimizing distractions. For some people, asking them to repeat or spell out the keyword can help caregivers to understand them. If excess saliva is an issue, then we would consider the strategies that we just talked about to try and manage that. Referral to a speech-language pathologist for speech therapy can help the person to speak more loudly and clearly, and they can also assess for various communication devices such as picture boards, portable amplifiers, or computers. And again, while the person is still able to communicate clearly, it's helpful to, for them to let their family know what their legal, financial, and end-of-life care wishes are. These discussions, of course, can be quite uncomfortable, but they enable caregivers to know and act upon the patient's wishes in the future. The ability to move the eyes downward is limited in people with PSP, and this often occurs in the first year of diagnosis, and of the first year of the disease, and so it's an important sign in making and confirming the diagnosis. Any activity that involves downward gaze is going to be difficult. For example, going downstairs, eating, reading, tying shoelaces, etc. And the problem is often compounded because the person has increased muscle tone and hyperextension of the neck. So not only can they not move their eyes down, but they have difficulty moving their head down as well. Care options include using devices to raise up plates and books, such as a reading stand or a large phone book under plates, using separate reading glasses rather than bifocals, as the person often can't move their eyes down into the lower section of the bifocal. Prism glasses can redirect the gaze upward. And using a large mirror that has a swivel base to allow the patient to be looking forward but seeing down when eating or doing things at a table, similar to the makeup mirrors that you can buy in the department stores. Another potential problem is double vision, and that results from difficulty bringing the eyes together or lining them up when looking at something else. And again, it's occurring due to the brain cell damage. Care options include putting a patch over one side of the eyeglasses when the person's reading or watching TV. However, the patch placed over the glasses um, to avoid scratching the cornea eyelid caught in the open position. Eyelid movements can also be affected by PSP. Many people will blink less often. And normally, blinking spreads tears, which keeps our eyes moist. So less blinking will mean drier eyes. That can lead to redness, stinging, and inflammation. And the body's response to inflammation is to produce more tears. So often, there's this paradoxical situation where there are both dry eyes and excessive tearing at the same time. Care options include using eye drops that don't contain an um, irritating preservative. Uh, in Canada, the brands that meet this criteria are Refresh, 
sustain, and genteel. However, eye drops may provide only temporary and incomplete relief. Several studies have found that omega-3 fat supplements and or a diet rich in omega-3 sources, such as oily fish, walnuts, flaxseed, and avocados, significantly reduces dry eye. And that's because uh, tear glands use omega-3 fats to make tears, and um, these omega-3 fats also tend to suppress inflammation. Warm compresses to the eyelids can also be helpful. And if these measures um, are not of help, then consulting with an optometrist or ophthalmologist is a good idea. Because the person is blinking less often, they're also going to be more sensitive to light or experience so photophobia. And so common sense things like wearing um, sunglasses um, or drawing the window shades um, can be helpful in those situations, even indoors. About a third of people with PSP also have difficulty opening their eyes. Blepharospasm, which is involuntary forced closure of the eyelids, can occur, as can difficulty with eyelid opening or apraxia of eyelid opening. And these symptoms can make it difficult, obviously, for the person to see and difficult to instill eye drops. Um, the optometrists, however, are finding that just as much medication gets into the eye when drops are instilled when the eye is closed and the head tilted back, followed by some rapid blinking, as when the eyes are open. So you can try that approach if you're trying to get eyelids into somebody or eye drops into somebody with these difficulties. Care options uh, for both blepharospasm and, and apraxia, again, would consist of Botox injections into the muscles around the eyes, and this will weaken them for about three months at a time, preventing their involuntary closure. Sometimes reducing the levodopa can also help. Um, it may have all other detrimental effects, but um, it can try to see what the effects of this approach would be. Just as PSP can cause slowness of other muscles, it can cause slowness of the back, resulting in constipation. The medications that we use in PSP, especially amantadine, can cause constipation. Care options, usual things, including increased fluid and fiber, exercise, adequate time on the toilet, preferably at a triggering meal, privacy during toileting, effective. People with PSP can also have bladder problems. Normally when our bladder fills, a reflex stimulates the muscles of the bladder wall so that it empties. The normal brain will inhibit this reflex until we're in a suitable place to void. In PSP, changes in the brain and in cells near the lower end of the spinal cord make it difficult to inhibit reflex bladder emptying. So this means the person will have a sudden urge to void as the bladder fills, and they won't be able to inhibit that. And this can be particularly troublesome at night and sometimes can lead to incontinence. Care options include ruling out urinary tract infection, promptly responding to call bells and to requests for toileting, and sometimes avoiding diary can be a useful thing to really find out what the best schedule would be. Medications such as Detrol, Ditropan, or others. Equipment such as a urinal or a spill-proof urinal, a bedside commode or a condom catheter, and incontinent briefs if the person is no longer continent. Today, we don't really have time to include a complete list of assessment and treatment options for bladder problems, so I refer you for a more comprehensive discussion to the Cure PSP webinar that was held on March 14th of this year. You can go to the Cure PSP website to listen to the archived presentation or to download the slides. 
Dystonia, or sustained muscle contractions, are common among people with advanced PSP, and these can affect the limbs, and they can also affect the neck. Both of these symptoms can cause problems with posture and can cause pain. Care options include cautiously reducing dopaminergic drugs to determine if they're contributing to the dystonia, regular Botox injections to weaken the muscles, adding or starting levodopa or amantadine to see if it has any beneficial effect on the rigidity, and relaxation techniques. I'm not aware of any studies on complementary therapies that specifically included people with PSP, but many therapies have proven to be safe and effective in promoting relaxation and reducing pain in other populations and would be expected to be helpful for people with PSP as well. So these are things like massage, and certainly our patients have told us that that's been helpful, especially for their neck stiffness, uh, imagery, mindfulness meditation, music, or therapeutic touch. And these therapies may also have a positive effect on the person's sleep and their overall sense of well-being. And I will um, provide some links for these uh, types of techniques at the end of the presentation as well. And for more information on music and how it can be used both with patients with PSP and with caregivers, again, I'd refer you to the archived Cure PSP webinar on this topic that was held on 2011 in August. which is the ratio of time asleep to time in bed, frequent nighttime wakening, worse over time, and may be related to damage to areas of the brain involved REM sleep. Stiffness can awaken every time they bed, and for you and I and any other individual medications, caffeine, interfere with sleep, and these sleep difficulty, but also give her living at home. Care option, short nap in the early afternoon, stimulating medications like amantadine, after that I just mentioned, offering a bedside or uh, bedtime, and minimizing light and noise. If the person is voiding at night, then exploring various methods of toileting or a toileting or changing schedule to see what would be acceptable to them and also what would be least disruptive to their sleep. If nighttime voiding is frequent and disruptive, the cause should be assessed by a physician and medications considered if they're appropriate. PSP can also cause personality changes. One of the most common is emotional lability, where the expression of normal feelings is exaggerated and the person laughs or cries uncontrollably or out of proportion to how they're feeling. And this symptom likely results from a chemical imbalance in the brain. Care options include sensitivity to the person's feelings so that we don't inadvertently add to their embarrassment. And if the emotional ability is very bothersome to the person, they can be offered treatment with clonazepam or an SSRI antidepressant agent. Irritability can also occur due to brain cell damage and this can be very challenging for family and professional caregivers. Strategies that can help caregivers include not taking the outbursts personally, trying to remember that this change is part of the disease process, and it's usually not within the person's voluntary control. Avoid arguing, explaining, or blaming yourself or the other person. Try open-ended questions to try to understand the meaning behind the behavior. For example, asking, can you tell me more about not wanting whatever? And trying to identify and minimize 
triggers. Again, occasionally SSRI antidepressants or antipsychotic medications may be needed. Another common personality change is apathy or lack of interest, which may manifest as withdrawal from social situations, loss of interest in once pleasurable activities, or loss of motivation. And major depression can also occur. Care options include invitations to participate in activities, counseling, and antidepressant medications. A mild form of, of dementia occurs in approximately half of people with PSP in the later stages of the illness. In these situations, memory usually remains intact, but the person may have slowed thinking and difficulty organizing multiple ideas. The person might also have apraxia caused by damage to the brain pathways that are carrying messages to the body about how to accomplish tasks such as brushing teeth or transferring out of bed. Unfortunately, often caregivers wrongly assume that the person has dementia because of a combination of the way that the other PSP symptoms present. The speech difficulty, the slow responses, the personality changes, the apathy, poor eye contact. Care options include allowing plenty of time for the person to respond to what you're seeing and doing, trying not to rush them even though you may feel rushed yourself at times, repeating yourself if the person asks you to do so, presenting one idea at a time. If there's a sudden or rapid change in thinking, always look for other causes such as medications or infection. Urinary tract infection especially is um, maybe asymptomatic but may cause um, confusion and uh, cognitive change. And apraxia, breaking the tasks into very small steps and using verbal or visual cueing can help the person to accomplish the goal. Thus far, this presentation is focused on symptoms and care options, but it's really important to put this information within the context of the whole person and their families. So before I share with you our research findings about what people with PSP and their families told us was most challenging and most helpful to them, I wanted to briefly touch on the concept of health within illness. With a focus on symptoms, it can be really easy to forget that the person with PSP, just like the rest of us, has strengths, hopes, and dreams. Health and illness aren't two ends of the continuum. They coexist, and so people can experience health within their illnesses. And nurse researchers have discovered that people who have chronic illnesses are particularly experiencing this health within illness when they're making choices, when they're connecting with other people, when they're laughing, when they have an opportunity to give to others, when they're connecting with their higher power, whatever that means to them, or when they're demonstrating courage in the face of their illness. And so caring for the whole person means recognizing, learning about, and supporting not only their symptoms, but also their experiences of health. And sometimes caregivers who are all pressed for time worry that this is going to take more time. But when we're supporting a person's abilities and acting on what's most important to them, we may actually find that we're saving time as well as deriving greater meaning and satisfaction from our interactions. Of course, we're also caring for families and those who have a loved one with PSP face many different challenges. In an earlier phase of our research, we held focus groups with patients and families, and they told us that their challenges uh, were many, and they fell into four different categories when we did the analysis. Symptoms, which we've talked about already. Services, especially the time that it took to get appropriate referrals and an accurate diagnosis, which is often years that this took lack of research and or failure to communicate research findings, 
and lack of knowledge among health care providers and among patients and families themselves. And it was interesting that this lack of knowledge among health care providers was the challenge that they identified most frequently. Other challenges faced by people with PSP and their families include fear of progressive symptoms and a shortened lifespan. On average, people are halfway through their disease by the time they're diagnosed and live for only another five to seven years after diagnosis. And the, the onset of the disease is most often when the person is in their 60s. Other challenges are difficulty witnessing of the decline of their loved one, fear that the PSP is hereditary, which is it is not, feeling alone because people usually don't know anyone else who's affected by PSP or even anyone else who's even heard of it. Being told that nothing can be done was of course very distressing to people. We may not be able to cure PSP yet or to slow the progression, but we can still help people to manage their symptoms, link them up with supports, and try to improve their quality of life, which is doing something. Lack of access to information, especially if the person's not internet savvy. Despair when they hear or read about the progression and lack of cure, and increased caregiving requirements. This can have implications, of course, for the caregiver's health, for their living situation, and for their finances. As the symptoms and the challenges change over time, the caregiving requirements will as well. Research has found that the first 18 months of after diagnosis has been a particularly challenging time, perhaps because the person is often still mobile enough to walk, but is falling often, being impulsive, and requiring supervision. And over time, there's generally an increase in paid caregiving, which brings its own challenges. And towards the end of life, hospice or palliative care may be needed, as well as grief counseling for the families. Our research also looked at what patients and families find helpful to deal with their challenges. And they identified many things, including community services, such as personal care providers, equipment and therapists to help with mobility, movement disorder specialists. These are neurologists who have additional training in movement disorders such as Parkinson's and PSP. And they often work with a team of nurses, therapists, and social workers. Other care providers who are knowledgeable about PSP, family support, research findings which help to foster hope, the Cure PSP website and literature was helpful for many people, while others found that information was overwhelming and debilitating, and they preferred, as they put it, to react to the situation as it's ha happening today. And support groups. These are held in Toronto at the Parkinson Society Canada office, as well as online through through Cure PSP with groups available for both ch children, caregivers, and, and patients. Some resources that are helpful to patients, families, and caregivers include Cure PSP, which is the main organization in North America that provides service to those affected by PSP, including literature and educational events, including webinars and conferences. Association, this is a European organization that has a variety of educational materials which are online and by mail. Parkinson Society Canada, which offers telephone counseling, a Toronto disease. National Parkinson's Foundation in the US, which has links to movement Disorder Centers of Excellence throughout North America. The Ottawa Health Institute's Feeding Tube Decision Aid. This is the one that I referred to earlier. It's really an excellent resource to help people consider all the many factors involved in making a decision about feeding tubes. And the last four bullets uh, 
are links related to the relaxation therapies that I mentioned before, including the mindfulness meditation, imagery, the Therapeutic Touch Organizations of Ontario, and the International Therapeutic Touch Organization. In a moment, we're going to be opening the presentation up to questions, but before we do so, I'd just like to remind you that the evaluation of the helpfulness presentation is very important uh, to help us achieve our goal of improving support to those affected by PSP. Therefore, after the question and answer period, before you log off, I'd certainly be very grateful if you could answer the three questions on this slide. And you can do this either by typing your responses into the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, or by emailing me at the address shown, or if I've emailed or faxed you a hard copy of this evaluation form, and this applies mostly to the people in Canada, you can either fax, mail, or email it back to me. And now we're ready to entertain your questions. Thank you, Teresa, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Um, at this point, I, uh, we'd like to open it to questions. Um, you'll see a, a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and uh, you should have the uh, a space there to type in any questions you may have. So go ahead and do that now if you have any questions for Teresa about the presentation uh, or in general. And we will, uh, we, will, we will answer the questions that we can. And while you're waiting, uh, we're waiting for questions, I just um, wanted to remind people that although only Bruce and I will be able to see your questions, we do want to protect um, patients' anonymity, so please don't include their names in your questions. Also wanted to just um, remind you that um, if any of your colleagues wish to view this presentation later, um, both the webinar and the slides should be posted on the Cure PSP website, I believe, by the end of the day tomorrow. We have a question here. How many people in Ontario live with PSP? Um, it's a good question. Unfortunately, we don't have any idea <laughs> about that. Um, uh, there is no sort of registry to be able to, um, to determine that. I know in our own practice here at the Center for Movement Disorders in Markham, we probably have um, approximately 30 people with PSP, 30 patients, um, and uh, we cover the Toronto area. There's also another movement disorder center downtown, which I'm sure has many other patients, and also northern Ontario. Um, but many people, because of the delay in diagnosis, also uh, hard to get an idea of the numbers. There's another um, question in terms of uh, any th thoughts on what are the most important things to look for in an assisted living facility. Um, and again, you know, many families have questions about and concerns about that move. I think certain only touring uh, a facility is helpful. It's unlikely that you're going to be in a facility where they've had any experience with this. So I prepared an uh, earlier version of this presentation and offered to give it to the staff, and that was very helpful for them. And in Ontario, I know the, um, um, the Parkinson's Society of Canada uh, will go in and give the presentation on request um, to a nursing uh, home. What we're suggesting actually now is that this facility will be archived and so that you refer um, the director of care to the website and ask for her to arrange for her staff to view the slides afterwards. Um, there is um, a question about diagnosis and um, diagnosis is really through physical exam. There's no way to uh, confirm uh, the diagnosis um, in, in any other way. Uh, a physician would look for the symptoms that we've talked about today, the early falls, the uh, rigidity of the neck more than the early uh, 
be swallowing problems. They will do an examination looking at the eye movements um, um, to see how the, those are. And there are specific criteria. And one of the handouts that Cure PSP um, includes in their physician packet goes through a DVD for which is the diagnosis of the condition. And just looking through the other questions, we're getting appreciate that. Uh, most common misdiagnosis that people get um, prior to their diagnosis of PSP, I don't actually I haven't seen the um, statistic on that, but based on our experience here in the clinic, I have Parkinson's, and sometimes the diagnosis of PSP doesn't really become clear. The eye movements changes may not become clear until later on. So those criteria that I mentioned earlier, which are available from Cure PSP um, and are probably on their website somewhere as well, um, they list um, possible and probable um, PSP, and really only a definitive diagnosis only possible with brain um, biopsy after death. Is there any difference, there's another question, any difference between PSP and the other names that you provided, such as Parkinson's Plus or atypical Parkinsonism? PSP is one of several um, diseases which fall under Parkinson's Plus and atypical Parkinsonism, so other ones would include um, MSA and cortical basal degeneration. Um, and so Parkinsonism really means it looks like Parkinson's, but it's not. It has some atypical features, and so PSP is one of those um, diseases. How does cortical basal degeneration uh, differ from PSP? Again, there'll be um, more detailed handouts on that on the uh, Cure PSP website. They also have materials for corticobasal degeneration. There is a considerable amount of overlap between the two diseases. And in fact, in studies where there have been autopsies done, um, sometimes the person who was diagnosed with PSP actually shows corticobasal degeneration or vice versa on the um, on the biopsy results or a combination of the two. Cortical basal degeneration has some um, unique features in terms of um, the person may have um, a sort of a levitation of one of the arms. Um, my experience, again, with the patients in our clinic, they're more likely to have um, dystonia, quite severe dystonia, affecting um, numerous parts of their body. Um, and for a more detailed um, explanation of the differences, uh, probably I would refer you back, back again to the Cure PSP weight. They do have a handout on uh, cortical basal degeneration, which is quite helpful. See, we have a comment about the beneficial ex um, effects of exercise. And um, yes, I didn't include that in my presentation, except um, indirectly in the section on therapists. But we certainly have had that feedback from some of our other patients as well. Exercise can um, help to um, maintain flexibility and, and reduce um, some of the rigidity and also has a beneficial effect on the person's mental well-being, of course, as well. There's a question about how much information should the patient and family be provided with upon diagnosis. Um, do we refer all patients to the Cure PSP website? Uh, you know, I think we always want to not overwhelm people with information. You know, different people have different requirements. so. Um, we do usually provide them with some information about the disease. Um, as part of our research as well, we developed a brochure that talks about the various symptoms and care options. So it's a very shortened version of what you heard today. Um, and we do give that to people as well as a handout that we developed that includes the Cure PSP 
services, the um, European organization, and the park sort of in a chart form so that um, they know how to access what's available and how to access that. But we caution people that, you know, to go at their own speed. You know, they may only want to read about the symptoms that they currently have and not look too far in the future at the beginning and take time. Um, to do that. I know certainly in the Parkinson's world, um, some of the research has, that has been done found that people found information that they had found on their own um, to be uh, quite helpful as opposed to information that they were given from others. So we want to be respectful of different people's learning styles and ways of coping. Um, Another question, when one loses speech contact with the patient, uh, do you revert to other experiences? i um, not sure exactly what that means. Um, we might use strategies such as the ones I talked about where we would encourage the person to use, you know, thumbs up and thumbs down or squeezing um, the, the caregiver's hand if they're able to do that to indicate their response or using eye movements or eye um, blinking other ways communication devices. Will we learn more about PSP if we choose brain donation? Will it provide more information than MRIs have done? Um, I'm not really in a position to answer that one, and I think that, again, uh, I know in Ontario, um, at least we don't have an option for donation of brains at the moment for PSP. There was at one point, and they sort of reached their quota and their funding, and so that's not an option at the moment in Ontario. Um, I can't really comment on um, on what else it, it offers um, in terms of information. Just going to scroll through some of the questions to see if I've missed some of the earlier ones. Don't believe I've. Oh, um, will a patient with PSP benefit from a G tube? Um, in some cases, they may. Uh, certainly, um, you know, there's two issues. I mean, when people have swallowing difficulties, one is obviously safety and prevention of aspiration pneumonia. The other is malnutrition if the person is having um, uh, difficulty swallowing. And uh, while G tubes don't completely eliminate the risk of aspiration pneumonia, they may reduce it. Um, we had one patient who had become quite malnourished and um, she recently had a G tube uh, placed and has been doing well since then. Again, it's a very individual decision and I think if you look at the decision tube, it will, or the decision guide that I gave you, it's not specific to PSP. But um, it does talk about some of the benefits um, and things to consider uh, in terms of that decision. Signs and symptoms of the last stage of PSP. We don't use um, staging a lot in our practice here just because we don't find it terribly helpful. Um, but common symptoms as the person is getting towards the end of their PSP is that they have have swallowing problems, they have um, lost most or all of their speech, they are in a wheelchair, um, and um, that would be sort of the presentation of, uh, of the person. There's also a question about contact information for myself, and um, if you're looking at the slide still with the evaluation, you'll see uh, an email address that says PSP survey at movementdisorders.ca. That is one of my email addresses, and uh, you can use that for contact information for me. 
as people are logging off, again, I just remind you, please, to remember to complete the three evaluation questions so that we can um, really understand how helpful this presentation has been. Are there any further questions? Leave this. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And uh, we are going to uh, close the webinar now. Uh, Teresa, thank you so much for presenting this information. I think a lot of people will find it very helpful. Um, the slides as well as a recording of the webinar will be available on the Cure PSP website uh, for people to watch uh, and access uh, probably starting tomorrow. You're welcome. And I'd just like to remind people. Uh, thank you all so much. If we can leave this slide up so that people can continue to complete their evaluations, that would be helpful.